Ben, are you planning to um, share your screen with the agenda? Yeah, hang on one second here. I'll get that up here. All right, folks, it's 9.32, and why don't we go ahead and jump into our agenda for the Water Availability Task Force meeting. I'm Tracy Kozloff from the Colorado Division of Water Resources, one of the co-chairs of the WATF. And um, Megan Holcomb, the, co the other co-chair from CWCB is on, but in double meetings today. And so I'm gonna be running our meeting um, meeting agenda, and I have Kat Weissmiller with me from CWCB, who um, I'm gonna kick it over to for our first announcement here. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Kat Weissmiller. I'm the Deputy Section Chief uh, for Water Supply Planning at CWCB. And um, welcome this morning. I just wanted to give a brief update. Uh, I know Megan's on here, but listening in, um, Megan Holcomb, who is the co-chair for the Water Av Availability Task Force, will um, be transitioning away. She's um, she's kind of slowly moving into a part-time role with CWCB and um, and will be around, but won't be um, fully chairing CWCB's Water Availability Task Force going forward. And we're in the process of hiring her replacement. So I just wanted to let you all know um, that as we go forward. So um, I will be setting up meetings. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me as we transition over to our new staff. Thanks. Kat. And Ben Wade, Ben's got another announcement. Yeah, so <clears throat> CWCB has a uh, podcast called Colorado Water Talk. And this month we interviewed Rush Schumacher. Um, I don't see him on yet, but uh, we interviewed him talking about La Nina, and so we'll be uh, releasing that shortly. So um, you can find us on um, all the um, usual podcast platforms. Um, so look it up and listen in on Russ. And uh, please forgive my Ben Stein monotone voice during the recording. Thanks, Tracy. <laughs> you bet. Uh... Okay, and I, I have a small announcement too, also from JWR, and that is, um, for those who might not be familiar, we do a calculation each month called the Swazi Surface Water Supply Index that looks at, this time of year, looks at um, streamflow forecast projections and reservoir storage to come up with basically an index about if we're high or low in terms of our water supply compared to, I think it's the last 30 years of the same month of January. And, um, and normally NRCS shows, um, shows a map of the Swazi as part of their presentation in this meeting. But we've been having some technical difficulty. Actually, I'll just admit I'm having technical difficulty because normally there's another staff person who generates that product and um, this person's been on extended leave and I'm having trouble with the program. So I don't have a Swazi for January. And so we're just going to work through those technical difficulties and we'll get the backlog of missing Swazis up, um, up again as soon as we work through that. But as you all know, there's no lack of other um, products that we're going to go through during this meeting. So um, my guess is nobody's missing it terribly yet. But in case anybody was, we're we're trying to get that back on track. Um, any announcements from anybody else on the call before we jump into the report from the state climatologist? I think another thing that we'd like to do, um, it's helpful to us, is could I have everybody write in the chat um, who you are and what organization you're joining us from? That helps, um, if nothing else, that helps us when we do our 
our roundtable um, discussion know, you know, who we want to ask for updates from the municipal side or ag, that kind of thing. So thank you. I see people are already doing that. Otherwise, I'd like to turn it over. I think, Peter, are you giving our presentation today from the state climatologist? I am. Okay, thanks a lot. Take it and away. And I will go ahead and share my screen if that's okay. Yeah, Peter, you should be able to now. Oh no, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Let's see, I will try one more time. Hmm. I'm not sure, is there a way you can kick it over to me right now when I'm hitting screen share, I'm getting that message. Oh, I think we might be okay. So I think you should be able to share now. Okay, let's see here. I'll share that. Let's see, are you seeing a slide that says climate update? Yeah. Great, awesome. Um, thanks everyone, good morning. Thanks for the announcements. I'm Peter with the Colorado Climate Center and I will be, uh, leading this uh, climate presentation for the next half hour or so. Um, for those who may be new to the format, we're gonna look at some of the climate statistics from recent months, mainly temperature and precipitation statistics around the state, uh, putting them in context. And then uh, I'll be giving a brief climate outlook uh, given what we know about what the next uh, weeks and months ahead may bring. So let's see. All right, and uh, to just change to the next slide. Yes. It's good. All right, I will stop asking. Sounds like things are working. Okay, so this is one of uh, Russ's quadrant charts that shows statewide where Colorado ranked. Uh, you can see we're looking at the month of December. The x-axis is accumulated precipitation. The y-axis is average temperature. And 2021 was uh, well within that warm and wet quadrant, which is actually interesting because I think that's the rarest of the four quadrants. And, you know, the explanation is actually uh, quite simple. It's, you know, in the, in the dry months, we, we tend to be um, under high pressure conditions a lot of the time, high atmospheric pressure conditions, which is, you know, where you have the clear, calm air. So, uh, warm and dry tend to go together and then cool and wet tend to go together because when you have the wetter months we're getting more storms and behind storms uh, with those cold fronts comes colder air. So uh, the only way you get the, the warm and wet combo, particularly in winter like this, is if you start the month anomalously warm like we did in, in December and then you have a wave of storms late in the month and we certainly had that uh, particularly on the west slopes where we saw some really good um, moisture and build to snowpack around the holiday season. We'll look at that more in some later slides as well. Okay, here is how things broke out spatially in the month of December. It was above normal temperature wise everywhere. You can see we're in the upper tercile everywhere, which means top 33% of the historical distribution. Um, the areas closest to normal were the low elevation areas of the uh, west slopes where, you know, we had snow on the ground for a fair bit of the second half of the month. And when you have snow on the ground, you reflect more sunlight away during the day, and then you can more efficiently emit energy out to space at night. So it uh, may, makes things cooler both day and night. Um, then you see uh, across much of the central and eastern portion of the state, top 10 percentile, very warm in the first half of the month, and still warm throughout much of the second half of the month in parts of eastern Colorado. Uh, it would be interesting to look at some station data, like around the Rye, Colorado City area, to see if that area of record warmest is in the station observations as well as the gridded data set. Here's what we've seen since the beginning of the calendar year, beginning of January in 2022. And I do apologize that many of these slides, you know, aren't updated through current date. It's kind of tricky timing with the MLK uh, holiday. A lot of these are updated through Thursday or Friday. Um, I did go in this morning and update some of the Outlook slides later, but through at least the beginning of uh, January, we did see cooler weather. You might remember um, New Year's Eve, things kind of changed east of the Continental Divide 
where we ushered in snow and, and cold air and we began the, the uh, month colder than a normal January for a change. Okay, here's a look at the first quarter of the water year or the first quarter of water year 2022, which we're now tracking. Um, so a lot of this was the warm December, but it was also a warm uh, November in particular. So we're looking at many areas where we had a record warm start to the water year and then a statewide above normal for the water year to date in terms of temperature. And then if we just back out to the calendar year and take a quick look, we see that uh, 2021 was our fourth warmest year on record statewide, but seven of our top 10 have occurred since 2012. So, you know, if you look at the time series, it doesn't necessarily look out of place. Um, here is that time series. So the upper graphic is the time series going back to 1895. Uh, through 2021 calendar year temperatures for Colorado. Um, it looks like, you know, we were behind uh, 2012, 2018, and it looks like 1934 there. Um, but this was largely driven by the second half of the year, and that's that second time series I'm showing on the bottom of the screen that shows just July through December rather than the whole calendar year. And you can see that 2021 uh, kind of leaps off the charts there right at the end of that um, time series. It was 1.3 Fahrenheit warmer than even our second place July through December. So not even a close comparison there. It was a very warm second half of 2021. Okay, now we'll transition into some precipitation statistics. Um, so this is showing the spatial distribution of precipitation throughout December of 2021, so just last month. And we see that it was a nice wet month on the west slopes, good for building snowpack. Uh, NRCS will be talking more about that for sure. Um, but then it was a drier than normal month east of the Continental Divide. And you can, you can really almost just make out the Continental Divide here based on where that transition is from uh, wetter than normal to drier than normal. It's, it's not perfect, you know, up in uh, North Park or even over Cameron Pass into Larimer, you have, you have some spillover moisture for sure, as well as some spillover into uh, the west side of the Rio Grande River Basin, um, but, but pretty close to a continental divide. Uh, I would say that this is kind of driven by um, the storms that we had more faithfully were blown in from west to east. So uh, we saw that the moisture racked up on the west slopes and here on what we call the leeward side of the Rocky Mountains, um, we got the downslope dry winds and I'll, I'll show some examples of windy days um, later in this uh, presentation. Another way uh, you, can, you can think of, of, about this is that the storms that we got in December um, were, were more of what we would call progressive low pressure systems, which means it just means that the um, polar jet stream was whisking them along quickly from west to east, where it's really the slow movers that give us time for upslope moisture to develop and for precipitation to occur in um, larger values on the eastern side of the continental divide. Here's a look at precipitation since the um, start of the calendar year. And as you can see, there was a, a big shift, particularly northern front range and urban corridor saw a better start to the calendar year than anything we saw in um, December at my place in Berthoud. Uh, I, I recorded my first above normal precipitation month since May already for um, the month of January, since even if we get zero from this point on, it will be above normal uh, for parts of the um, Front Range and Urban Corridor. And that's not because it's been, you know, super wet. You know, a lot of these areas we're talking an inch of precipitation so far since the start of the calendar year. But when your normal is a half inch or lower for the whole month of January, uh, it doesn't take much to have one of those high percentage of normal values. And then similar to temperature, here is a look backing out at uh, to the start of the water year 2022, so the first quarter of the water year, October through December. 
And we see a similar pattern to uh, the December precipitation where east of the continental divide, we've started the um, water year quite dry, whereas we've started on the west, the wet side on the west slopes. If we look at the calendar year of 2021, uh, statewide, a little bit below average, but really kind of a nice mix. Um, we started the, the first half of the calendar year 2021. We had a nice wet spring out in eastern Colorado, followed by a dry summer and fall. Uh, kind of the reverse of that, if we looked on the west slopes where we had a dry spring, followed by a pretty decent monsoon season, in some areas very good monsoon season in late summer. And then in uh, December, we saw another really nice month of accumulation. So um, a lot of wet and dry periods throughout the year, somewhat balancing out when we um, take a look at the calendar year. Okay, and then here's a similar picture with time series for the full calendar year, as well as just the last um, six months. So for the calendar year, we were the 47th driest on record. So um, somewhat in the middle of the distribution going back to 1895, um, we were just a little bit on the low side of the distribution. So 1.08 inches below normal uh, statewide. And then if we look at the July through December timeframe, um, about an inch below normal through that time frame as well, but again, very unevenly distributed throughout the state with the second half of the year, the west slopes doing um, considerably better than the eastern side of the continental divide. And then if you look at uh, that July through December time frame, we actually see that it looks like it's been since uh, 2015 that we've had an above normal um, or above average second half of the calendar year. Our uh, summer fall timeframes have, have tended to be dry in recent years. Um, here's a look at the evaporative demand drought index for the last uh, three months. So this is the effective thirst of the atmosphere for water vapor, which is not only a function of temperature, but also um, wind speed, uh, surface humidity, cloud cover are all considerations here. And the color scheme, at least on the dry side, is designed to match the US drought monitor. So the reds that you're seeing are bottom five percentile and the deep reds are bottom two percentile, at least in terms of being dry rather than being wet. And we don't talk about evaporative demand as much this time of year typically because it tends to be more important during the growing season. But, you know, I, th I think it's important to bring up here because the um, warm drying conditions that we've seen, I, I think uh, were part of setting the stage for the type of event we saw with the Marshall Fire right at the um, end of December. Certainly the combination of a wet spring where you build the grasses taller and thicker followed by a long drying period, um, it, it certainly helps set the stage. Uh, it's, it's a weather event for sure, but it, setting the stage with some of the um, antecedent conditions. And I also bring this up because particularly in Southeast Colorado, where we tend to see more of our brush fires historically, um, maybe this is something we should be uh, keeping on our radar for future months. All right, so if I haven't blown you away yet, we're gonna show some uh, wind gust statistics from some of the recent weather events. So this is a map of wind gusts from the December 15th event of 2021. And we have a 100 mile an hour gust um, sort of in that Palmer Divide territory just northwest of Colorado Springs. And we see pretty widespread really all across the state in this event, 50 plus mile an hour gusts. So um, this, this event was um, somewhat unique in that we don't often see this high of wind gusts across so much of the state in a single day. And then here is that uh, December 30th event. 
um, from when, when the Marshall fire occurred. And I know there were some higher gusts even than what's shown with that 74 on the map near Boulder, but you can see that uh, the wind gusts were much more localized on that day than say the December 15th day. Uh, we did have nearly 80 miles per hour up um, at Monarch Pass um, on the border of Chaffee County and Gunnison County there, but in general, much more localized than that December 15th event. All right, um, here's a map showing current soil moisture percentiles. So you can just see how we've dried out on the uh, Eastern Plains. Much of that brown area is 20th percentile or lower for soil moisture entering uh, calendar year 2022. We see a mix west of the Continental Divide with more of the warm, or sorry, more of the cool colors or the blue colors um, in the lower elevation areas. And that's really owing to the fact that in the higher elevations, the moisture that we've received recently is snow that you know has not melted. So we're gonna see the effects of that um, in, the, in the spring. All right, and just um, looking at some of what we've experienced over the second half of the calendar year, I thought it was interesting to set this in a climate context or more of a changing climate context. The table that we're seeing here comes from uh, the Western water led climate change in Colorado synthesis report that was conducted uh, several years back. I believe it was re released in 2014, so better part of a decade now, but it shows um, the expected changes in, in, in temperatures across months and regions of Colorado for the middle of the century, this century, versus the end of last century. And we see um, more consistently warm conditions in the late summer and early fall um, with, with a, you know, less warming in the late winter, early spring. And as, as we look at kind of separating the um, temperatures and precipitation patterns that we're looking at into halves of the year, like we did a couple slides ago, uh, we, we can really uh, kind of see that present in 2021. And then if, if you just look at the overall time series, the last 10 years um, over the second half of the year, you know, we're uh, one and a half to two Fahrenheit warmer than the 20th century average. So kind of well on our way to some of these projections. And then since this is older data, I also included a similar plot um, for the Western US as a whole from the uh, latest IPCC interactive report um, that came out just a few um, months back. And then if, if we look at the same thing for precipitation, we see that um, kind of both in the observations as well as the projections that we're on our way to uh, a, a future where we, we experience similar precipitation, but it's a little bit more concentrated on the um, winter spring timeframe than uh, the summer. Uh, I don't wanna get, if you look at the percentages, uh, the, the, the changes, they're, they're fairly small overall, um, negative 10% to plus 20%. So I, I don't want to give the uh, impression that the climate of Colorado will be unrecognizable in, in the middle of the century or that it is now. Um, just we're, we're seeing more years and it kind of fits with the projections where we get more of our precipitation in winter, spring and have, have to make do with what we get through uh, warmer summer and potentially warmer uh, drier fall. Uh, another thing that's important when looking at these kinds of projections is to recognize the role of interannual variability, where we know from one year to the next things are very different. Uh, water can uh, the amount of water that we get uh, goes it goes up and down quite a bit from from year to year, and that's certainly still the case and will continue to be the case. All right, so now we're going to take a look just at how we've started the water year for some of our indicator st stations um, around Colorado for regions um, one moving counterclockwise to region eight uh, with the Boulder Station. These regions were um, divided by Klaus Wolter using an analysis of the seasonality of temperature and precipitation especially. So starting with our Grand Lake Station, 
uh, we see that we're a little bit below normal to start the water year. We had a really good December. Things have been dry again uh, recently. If you look forward at, if you were to project any of the previous mid-January through um, September traces onto the remainder of the water year, you see that we get quite a large range. So still uh, early in the water year, most anything uh, could happen, but certainly a good thing that we had that wet December. Somewhat of a similar story with uh, Steamboat Springs, we're, we're a little bit on the low side of average. Um, if you look at the traces projected out from the um, current spot, you see we can end up any number of places above or below normal. Steamboat had a more uh, normal October in terms of moisture than a lot of areas around the state where they uh, did okay. Dry November and then things uh, picked up again at the end of December, beginning of January. All right, that slide's supposed to be uh, Grand Junction, which is missing, so I'll get back to you on that. Here is Montrose, where we can see we started the water year on the dry side of normal. Good news is if we were to trace this back a couple months, Montrose is part of the area that had a good monsoon, so it uh, would look better if we looked at, say, the last um, six months or even four or five months. Uh, it got a, a decent bump of moisture in mid-December, but still just 48% uh, of average to start the water year. Mesa Verde is in a little bit better position, got a really nice storm that third or fourth week of December. Um, right now, 94% of average. And if you look at those traces going forward, it could go any number of uh, directions. Um, if we look at Alamosa at the Bregman Field Station, the San Luis Valley is an area that's been quite dry for some time now. Uh, we saw that it was dry throughout the second half of the calendar year 2021, and that's continued into January. So certainly a better probability than not already that we'll have a below normal water year here and just 39% of average to start the year. Uh, good news, if there is any, is that the wet season here tends to be, you know, the July-August time frame. So if we get a nice wet season, uh, really, really hit the wet season hard, things could turn around. Here is a look at the Colorado Springs Station at the Municipal Airport. Uh, again, it's a dry start to the water year. Just uh, looks like we're uh, at 30% of average there. And then Walsh, only 32% of average. And the, the last couple stations really show you how um, Eastern Colorado, we have the, both the short-term and the long-term drought, whereas Western Colorado, we've seen some better moisture recently, so the primary concern is more long-term at this point. And then uh, Akron, similar story, only 35% of average to start the water year. But again, with all these stations, uh, winter is climatologically the dry season, so a really nice uh, wet, wet season and things could turn around as you can see um, from the traces in these faded gray lines, if you projected forward a number of uh, previous year's precipitation onto what we have currently, uh, you can still certainly re reverse this dry start. And then Boulder, you see just how dry it was until right at the end of January when we got uh, a, a decent snow event followed by another okay snow event, still just 39% of average to um, start the water year. Uh, but better conditions since the start of the new calendar year. I can't like help but point out the 2013 trace every time I show this, this graphic, how it just leaps out from the middle of the dis distribution to clearly the highest. So if you have a, a climatological extreme, it's, it's amazing how quickly the narrative can, can change. Okay, now I'm gonna show a couple slides um, with US drought monitor maps and this is the US Drought Monitor as of the end of the water year 2021, where we were coming off of still a wet spring in Eastern Colorado. So we didn't see much drought depicted on the map yet, just uh, some short-term drought. And we had the long-term drought still very much in play in Western Colorado. Um, Akron was kind of the poster child for extremes this year where um, March through May was the wettest on, rec on record at the Washington County Airport Station, and June through um, August was the driest on record, so uh, quite the swing there. Uh, but this is where we were at the end of the water year, 
And then this is uh, where we are currently. So a big change in Eastern Colorado, if you just kind of toggle back and forth, things have improved a bit on the West slopes, but um, drier in Eastern Colorado. And then here's a 24 week change map where you can see that, that uh, what I was just showing toggling back and forth in one map. All right, now I'm gonna move into a, a few slides on you know, projections and where, where things might end up going forward. So we have La Nina in effect. And if you uh, tune into Ben Wade's podcast coming out soon uh, with my boss, Russ Schumacher, you'll, you'll learn more about what La Nina means for uh, Colorado. But this, this graphic is showing sea surface temperature anomalies focusing on the Pacific uh, Ocean where we see that cold tongue of uh, waters over the eastern and central equatorial Pacific, as is characteristic of La Nina. Um, we also see the signs of a negative phase Pacific decadal oscillation, which is where you have warm anom anomalies over the north central Pacific and cool anomalies um, off the west coast. Um, so we'll get into what La Nina and that means for uh, Colorado, but that's that's where we're at with um, with with uh, the sea surface temperatures. Um, here are the here's the departure from normal temperature map for the last month, and this is quite characteristic of La Nina. So during La Nina years uh, nationwide, you often see cooler than normal temperatures over the north central U.S and warmer than normal over the South and, and Southeast US. So we've definitely seen that over the last month. So this uh, La Nina is, is behaving a lot like a, a typical La Nina. You also tend to see um, wetter conditions up in the Pacific Northwest as, as well as near the Great Lakes and Ohio River Valley and drier further to the South. And then for Colorado, oftentimes, the storm motions like I talked about are more progressive where they uh, we have low pressure systems quickly whisked from west to east and during the winter uh, it, it can be a little bit better for the west slopes but not not so much um, further south and, and further east. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit more in, in the next couple slides but before we do that here is a uh, look at the projections for where we're at with La Nina. So um, right now we're at sea surface temperature anomalies of about one C below normal. And then projected going forward, we're looking at a bunch of uh, different statistical and dynamical models uh, of, of where we might end up. The um, red line is the average of the dynamical models. The green line is the average of the statistical models. And then the blue line is the Climate Prediction Center's consolidation. Not sure what happened with this uh, purple model out here, but the Climate Prediction Center's consolidation actually has us um, has this La Nina fizzling more quickly than um, some of the other, than either the average of the dynamical or the statistical guidance. That may be uh, good news because La Nina in spring, um, tends to be uh, a little bit drier for Colorado. You know, certainly we don't have as big a chance of a wet extreme as we do during El Nino's. A lot of our really nice wet springs have been during El Nino years. Uh, I think I've heard Klaus describe El Nino as more kind of boom or bust, whereas in La Nina, you're more apt to get a lot of uh, smaller, drier storms that don't give you as much. Um, this graphic is, uh, I, I think it goes along with, with what uh, I've heard Klaus say um, before quite nicely. It's the correlation between um, the El Nino Southern Oscillation or our El Nino versus La Nina state and uh, seasonal precipitation accumulation for winter in the upper right, or sorry, upper left, spring in the upper right, um, summer in the lower left and fall in the lower right. Where you see red colors are areas where um, El Nino is favored for wetter conditions. And where you see bluer colors, which is almost nowhere, La Nina is favored. You do see a little bit of blue though in the Northern Rockies in winter. So uh, hopeful that we can continue to get some decent moisture and uh, make, make good use of that in the Northern and, and Central Rockies going forward. Um, 
over the next, uh, you know, seven days or really even the next 14 days. And these are the slides that I did have a chance to update. Not, not a good shot for moisture. Right now we do have, uh, unfortunately, high pressure conditions across the um, Western US kind of off of the West Coast. There's a big, what we call blocking high pressure uh, ridge. So it's, it's deflecting a lot of the good moisture that we could potentially get from uh, the, the ocean up and around it. So up, up to the north around us. Uh, and we're looking at dry conditions, uh, primarily dry conditions over the next seven days. There will be a, a couple fronts that kind of clip us and give us a little bit of moisture east of the continental divide, both tomorrow and Friday, but they're not going to be game changers in terms of drought. And, and certainly up in the um, up in the high country, it's not looking like a, a big week. And then here's the Climate Prediction Center's guidance for the uh, next eight to 14 days. First, we're looking at temperatures where we're seeing um, probabilistically above normal temperatures are favored for much of the state, a uh, little corner of near normal in Northeast Colorado. And then uh, if we look at precipitation, once we get into the 18 or the eight to 14 day time frame, um, near normal conditions are, are favored throughout much of the state with, with just a little swath of, of below normal uh, out, out east. Now, as we get into the seasonal guidance, um, this is a look at January, February, March. Um, so we've already you know, gone halfway through January, but looking forward over the next two and a half months, we see um, Warmer than normal temperatures are, are favored um, throughout much of southern Colorado with equal chances, or as we affectionately call, equal, equally clueless over the um, northern half of Colorado. But if you look at the um, continental U.S. or contiguous U.S. as a whole, we see that this um, forecasted pattern is quite... Um, you know, quite characteristic of, of La Nina. It's, it's maybe a bit shifted where um, rather than the north central U.S., we have the northwest U.S. being forecast to uh, be below normal, but then certainly the uh, southern and southeast U.S. above normal make, makes sense given a La Nina year. And then here is the seasonal precipitation uh, outlook where we're, we're seeing somewhat similar to temperature. There's um, equally clueless in the northern half of the state, but then an increased chance of below normal um, precipitation for the um, southern part of the state. So uh, northern part of the state, equal chances, southern part of the state, uh, below normal or you know, increased probability of below normal, which, which makes sense with La Nina. Generally with La Nina, the further south you go, the higher the odds of below normal precip this time of year. And then uh, th this is a, a couple leads down the road, as, as we would say, or I guess if if, uh, if January through um, March is kind of your lead zero, this would be uh, your lead two or two months out to the start of the period. Uh, the March through May um, outlook, we're looking at increased chance of above normal temperature. That's a mix of just being what we see with La Nina and then also seeing a, you know, a, a trend towards warmer springs in, in general. And then we're actually seeing a uh, increased chance of below normal precip across much of the state in March, April, May of 2022. And you know what I'm about to say 2021 doesn't fit with at all for the uh, Eastern Plains, um, but typically there is a much better chance of a wet extreme or a really nice wet spring when you have El Nino conditions, as I showed a few slides ago. So, you know, we, we could end up, up near normal for certain. Some areas are, are likely to even be above normal just because of how much things vary spatially. Uh, but the tilt probabilistically is towards, you know, below normal precipitation for the springtime. Um, and, and we're going to hear a lot more about this from NRCS in just a couple minutes, so I won't spend too much time on this, but thankfully snowpack is in a pretty good uh, position to start the year for most basins. 
Uh, in the Gunnison River Basin, in some areas, the snowpack that we have on the ground now is already around what peak snowpack is in a bad year. So uh, lim limits um, how bad things can be in basins where we've already racked up a, a decent amount of snow. Of course, the Arkansas River Basin and the Rio Grande there you see a little bit uh, be behind. Um, this, this is one fun extreme uh, example from Schofield Pass where they actually had the wettest 10 day stretch on record near the end of December. And then uh, again, you'll hear more about this from NRCS, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But I, I projected forward uh, the snowpack we have now with what, what would we end up with um, in April if we had an 80th percentile event or a 20th percentile event going forward. And again, this doesn't capture the full range of variability, but the low numbers show what you get if you um, had a uh, 20th percentile event from this point and the high numbers show what you'd get if you had an 80th percentile event from this point. And then uh, th this was kind of the numbers that, that I, this isn't a real forecast, it's mostly for fun, but if you uh, were, were to uh, keep in mind what CPC is saying and what, what La Nina means for us, this is sort of where I was estimating we might end up. And if you think about areas like the Gunnison River Basin being at 140% of normal now, 115 might seem low, but this is more about regression to the mean really than it is about, um, about things being dry. So for instance, if, if Trevor Story was hitting uh, a batting average of 350 at the end of May, it would take a bold statistician to uh, project forward that he would be hitting 350 at the end of the year. All right, so that's all I've got for you. Um, some key takeaways, drought remains an issue statewide. Um, at this point, we, we'd call it long-term drought out, out west more so than short-term or short-term and long-term, whereas we have kind of both short and long-term drought in play east of the continental divide with the uh, dry and warm start to the water year. Um, then we've got, a, you know, we had a wet spring followed by a warm dry fall, which, um, may have uh, helped set the stage for off, kind of off-season wildfire, uh, like we saw with the um, Marshall Fire. Then, you know, December was, was warm and wet out west, but warm and dry east of the divide. Overall statewide, we kind of had that rare combo of warm and wet. And then we remain in a La Nina pattern. It is uh, expected to weaken over time, but during La Ninas, we tend to um, see lower probability of a nice wet spring. So um, right now the, the tilt is towards a, a, a drier spring. So that, that's all I have. Um, I, I can stop sharing my screen now, but if there's any questions, comments, I'd be happy to field those at this point. Any questions for Peter? All right, well, thank you, Peter. I'm not hearing any questions from our audience here. Uh, next item up on the agenda is our report from the NRCS. I believe I saw Brian uh, join us earlier. Brian, are you gonna be doing the NRCS presentation today? Yeah, that's right. Good morning, Tracy, how you doing? Good, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Awesome. Yeah, all right, let me share my slides. Um, I think I gotta share my screen too, right? All right. Um, I got three windows here and it's only, sh it's not showing the one that I wanna put up there. Um, Let's try this. Hmm. Uh, let me see if it does this in screen sharing mode. Something is happening now. All right, now we're seeing the, <clears throat> not the presentation view. Oh, there you go. Are you seeing the presenter view or the presentation view? We're seeing the presenter view so I can see 
the slide that's coming next for you as well. All right, let me see if I can clean that up. And for some reason, it doesn't want to share a screen. It just wants to share programs. Uh, I think I might have it here. I just needed to put it into presentation. There it is. Into, Perfect. There we go. Okay. Well, I didn't want you guys to be seeing uh, the next slide that would just give away all of the, the, the surprise that I have in store here. Um, okay. So uh, good morning, everybody. Um, sorry for the slight delay there. Um, hope everybody's well and having a good new year. Um, uh, I just want to start off with uh, some kind of announcements in the November. Uh, I provided a little bit of an update of what's going on with our web pages and products. Um, things are in um, a general mode of transition uh, with a lot of our products and tools. Um, let me start off by saying that the IMAP and the report generator are uh, going to be unchanged. Um, they've, they've had some improvements uh, and we'll continue to see uh, regular improvements. Um, but those those should be largely unchanged. However, um, static maps and graphs, PDFs, uh, those are going through some changes, uh, both uh, the, the maps themselves and uh, the web locations, the web addresses at which they're located uh, are unfortunately having to go through some changes. Um, so uh, give yourself a little bit of time. You might need to find some replacements for those. In many cases, we've tried to do as many redirects as we can or just replace them with new tools. Um, but uh, a lot of the static PDF maps that we've provided in the past are, are, are slowly transitioning away. Um, and these are because of some uh, IT requirements that uh, we've been passed down. Unfortunately, we were not given very much lead time for those changes. Um, so we're doing our best, forgive us, uh, as we try to work through that. And uh, some people will notice that uh, some of our products are not updating, but maybe once a week, um, there's a number of things going on there and we're trying to do our best to get those uh, replaced. Finally, um, at the end of October, uh, 2022, we are hearing that we're going to be going through another web change. Um, so uh, we are anticipating some changes there as well. Sorry to, to go on and kind of rant and rave about that. Um, but if you guys have any questions for us, don't hesitate to reach out to us um, uh, to, to locate products and, and tools and whatnot. But unfortunately, uh, I think we all know how IT things go. Uh, so things are changing and hopefully we can maintain services. Okay, um, I have structured the presentation uh, differently uh, this time around than uh, previously. Uh, previously, we had 80 some slides. I tried to get that down to about half of that. So what I thought I would do, excuse me one sec. Excuse me. So what I thought I would do is uh, kind of uh, sum up the whole uh statewide situation, of course, with snowpack, reservoir, precipitation, uh, all of all of the, the good stuff we typically provide you with, It'd give you an idea of what we're seeing statewide, uh, what we've seen, um, and then kind of dive into some of the individual cases of, uh, you know, basins, uh, changes that we've seen uh, as they need to be highlighted. So some of the bigger changes, you know, in each of the, the basins. Um, just to give you an idea of where things stand, you know, what's the lowest basin, what's the highest basin, uh, those kinds of things. But in general, you know, let's focus it around uh, what the the, um, the average is statewide. And, and if anything uh, strays from that, positive or negative, I'll try and provide that information to you here individually in the, in the basins. Wow, sorry, jumped ahead three slides with one click. Uh, okay, so statewide snowpack, um, as Peter showed uh, a little bit, uh, we did see that that pretty big uh, increase throughout much of December, really uh, across much of the state. The improvement was from about December 22nd through about January 6th. Um, but in general, you know, we're, we're still summing that up uh, over the course of December. Can't forget this nice little boost we got here across the western portion of the state um, here in earlier December. But uh, right now, snowpack statewide is about 119% of median as of yesterday morning. Um, this ranks ninth in this 37-year period of record. And um, 
uh, I'm, in many cases, what I did was uh, at the beginning of January, I was kind of summing up what happened over the course of December. Uh, so in a lot of the, these graphs, these projection graphs here, uh, I, I created or I, I generated some numbers based on what we saw. And uh, I would also put, like to put a little bit of an asterisk uh, caveat here. Uh, this 190% of median increase, uh, I calculated that at the beginning of January. And since then we've done some edits and some of these numbers have changed a little bit, but in general, the the, uh, the message is the same. Uh, we saw a significant, much needed increase uh, in snowpack um, across most of these basins that I'm gonna highlight here. Um, so from December 1st through January 6th. Uh, and in the, the case of the state, we saw 193% of median increase. Um, and then that translated to a 7.1 um, inch increase in water over the course of uh, December 1st through January 6th. So much needed, it's huge, it's great. Something we've been wanting uh, for, for many years, I would actually say for, uh, let's go with two or three years. Um, precipitation wise, um, uh, December, we saw 193% of average precip. So that is uh, from December 1st through January 1st. And then uh, January precipitation from uh, January 1 through January 17th has been right at normal uh, for that time frame at 100% of average. Okay. Um, so this is the month to date precip map. Um, so here again, uh, I think Peter kind of pointed to this and it's become evident to me in the mountains that uh, in January, uh, snowpack has really made its improvements uh, the further east that you get. Um, and it, it's been through that, that early part of January, that January 6th through 7th timeframe is where we really saw some accumulations. Uh, and the further east you get here on the front range, North Platte, um, even the Arkansas, uh, has seen better accumulations here uh, in the last week or so, but it, it's not been as, as good as the improvements that we saw on January, uh, up to January 6th, I should say. Uh, and then uh, looking towards the San Juans, uh, even the Grand Mesa, but more so, you know, the further southwest you get, uh, January has not seen too much precip, but uh, we had excellent uh, December precipitation and of course snowpack accumulation um, in southwestern Colorado and we'll get to that here in a little bit. Um, just showing the, the actual time series of precipitation uh, increase uh, across the state. Um, statewide uh, precipitation is 112 percent of normal uh, or 112% of average and 114% of median and then much above what we were seeing last year at this time. Oh, sorry, I should start using my mouse over here uh, instead of on the presenter screen. Uh, so see a much, uh, much improved precipitation. You can see that we were below normal and then uh, we are now above normal for precipitation. And of course, this time of year, all of that fell in snow. Um, fortunately, so so things are looking pretty good. Um, the last time this product was updated was on January 10th, and uh, the main reason I'm I'm showing this here is for the statewide number. Uh, at that point, it was 128 percent of normal, as I pointed out earlier. Uh, things have dried out a little bit since uh, January 7th, when the snowstorms kind of slowed down, and, and numbers have drifted downward since then. So that's why I pointed out earlier uh, that statewide snowpack was was at uh, 119 percent of normal as of uh, yesterday morning. Um, and, and while I'm on it, uh, this graph, or excuse me, this map is one of the ones that I, I kind of think of when I speak about uh, some of the lost functionality that we're looking at for products going forward. Uh, this is a product that we have to manually run every morning. Somebody has to come in and hopefully somebody's there at six or seven and, and presses the button to get this running. Uh, but it, we have been, not only have we been having troubles with it, but it's uh, being, uh, more difficult to support. And unfortunately, this is one of our more heavily used maps and products. We really rely on that statewide number, but we don't have that support from the Water Climate Center yet. We're trying to get them to push uh, to get these statewide numbers on uh, the, the other maps that I'll be showing here today. But uh, so here, is, here again, if you, if you see this map and it's not updated, uh, we are aware that it's not updated. We're trying to get it updated as quickly as we can. If you need it uh, badly, uh, reach out to us and, and we can try and run that for you. Okay, moving uh, into um, 
well, yesterday or two days ago here again, uh, IT has been creating a little bit of trouble and we were only able to up the, update this on the 16th, not yesterday on the 17th. So here's a little bit of an updated map. Peter showed, I think the, the 14th of January, um, much improved snowpack across the state. Uh, I'll get into that very briefly here a little bit later, the, the actual uh, percentage improvement, but um, the Arkansas really not seeing the, the best snowpack uh, or, you know, as good a snowpack as we're seeing around the rest of the state. The upper Rio Grande's the same. However, uh, all the way from the South Platte to the San Miguel de Lourdes, San San Juan, uh, snowpack is looking uh, great, especially when we compare it to what we've seen over the last few years. Uh, we will take this. This is awesome. And as Peter referred to uh, with where we're at this at this point in the year, you know, there, there still is uh, time for changes to be made uh, in the up or down direction. But right now, this is some of the best scenarios that we've seen at this point in the year um, compared to where we've been over the last three, even kind of, let's go with three years. Yeah. And the Gunnison has really kind of been the bullseye uh, of, of, uh, the majority of the December accumulations, um, not so much uh, January, but really uh, the Gunnison has, has seen some great improvements. Um, if you can zoom in here, uh, sorry, these numbers are small, but I really wanted to point out um, the, the SWE gains or the SWE improvements in terms of percent of normal. Um, you can see here, uh, Schofield Pass was 652% of normal um, snowpack, and, and Peter highlighted that earlier. Uh, I'm going to get into that a little bit more deeply here um, at the end of the presentation. But yes, yeah, Schofield Pass uh, really saw some great improvements. Uh, the Grand Mesa, I've noticed, uh, saw some great improvements. And just this whole central Colorado area, looking at the, the December to January uh, snowpack accumulations that we saw, there was some great improvements in the collegiate range and the, the um, central mountains, the very central mountains of Colorado, uh, the Grand Mesa, um, and I would assume even the West Elks uh, got hit pretty hard. But, you know, still the numbers are great. Uh, you look at uh, some of these sites here in the front range. Um, and by the way, I forgot to mention, this is from December 22nd to January 6th. I really wanted to highlight that, that period um, that saw some the, the biggest improvements, um, although much of December was great. Uh, and then looking at the actual uh, SWE value increase, you know, uh, here again, um, Schofield Pass saw 15 inches of snow water equivalent improvement. Um, it, it's almost hard for me to believe to even say that. I, I almost want to go in and check that. Uh, but again, that was just from that December 22nd to the January 6th period. Uh, and then here, you know, uh, double digits. Um, 12 inches at Coombers Trestle, um, and then Tower Junction. I can't quite make out what it saw, but uh, again, it is in the blue. Um, and then here in the flat tops, we saw, see one of the sites, I can't remember which one that is, at, at 10.5 inches of actual SWE gain. Man, um, I, I want to go through and check these numbers, but uh, they, they are they're great improvements. Um, and then, uh, okay, so how does that translate to, to, to Streamflow forecast? I'm gonna get into some of the underlying stuff here after this, um, but basically uh, the January Streamflow forecast, January 1 Streamflow forecast that, that were produced uh, are really showing some, some uh, um, great potential Streamflow runoff scenarios uh, come spring. Um, so looking at the South Platte and Arkansas, we're right at normal um, in general across those those basins, you know, you can see some of the individual values not so great here in the, the Southern Sangres. Um, and then, you know, the, the upper South Platte, um, near to slightly below normal, but uh, when we get north, uh, further north in the South Platte, values look better. So uh, these, these more bold numbers here, I, I just tried to use to kind of sum up what's happening across the, the basin. So take those with a grain of salt because um, what's really driving that is, is these values here and the way they're weighted. So I would highly encourage you to look at the individual um, stream flow forecast that you're indicate, uh, interested in, but, you know, in a, to try and sum it up, these bold numbers can, can kind of give you a better idea, or I shouldn't say a better idea, it should, can give you a generalized idea of what the entire basin is seeing. You might also want to look at the poor points, you know, um, so the White River here uh, at, at the confluence at the end here is 110% of normal. These are some other indications here. The Gunnison is looking at 132% of normal uh, total runoff here uh, for, for uh, 
based on the conditions that we're seeing right now. And, and that assumes uh, near, normal precip uh, near normal precipitation from here through uh, the end of the forecast period. Um, and I, I thought Peter's uh, projections were, were really pretty good. And I like the fact that he provided the range um, of what we could potentially see. Um, so I really appreciate that, Peter. Thanks, Ben. Uh, that, that shows, you know, that, uh, I can't remember which basin it was, but I think I saw a few were, you know, between 95 and 130% and of normal. Um, and I, I think those are pretty reflective. So hopefully uh, we get near normal precipitation uh, from here on out and these pan out. But, uh, you know, at, at this point, um, uh, on January 18th, we've typically seen about 52% of our uh, snowpack accumulation season happen to this point. So really we're on the backside um, uh, of the winter, so to speak. Uh, uh, we're at a great spot where we're at right now with snowpack. Uh, not gonna take that for granted, but also wanna realize that realistically, we still have half of our accumulation season to happen. So um, things can change if it, if it dries out significantly. Okay, moving on, um, statewide reservoir storage is 78% of normal. Uh, it's great to see the upper Rio Grande at 74%, um, you know, improvements after last year, but still uh, things are below normal. Um, and and uh, now with the snowpack that we've got, hopefully it will translate to improved reservoir storage. Um, but, but that is really yet to be seen with half of the year yet to come. And then here is a... a Yes. Brian, sorry, it's Tracy. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I just saw we had a question in the chat from Zach Margolis. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry I can't see the chat, so That's thanks, it. I'm Trace. happy to read it to you, and Zach, I hope I said your, pronounced your name correctly. The question is, are probable trans-basin diversions assumed in the forecasts? Can you describe what type of forecast these are, Brian? Yeah, yep, great question. Um, Yes. So for the most part, they are. We do take the diversions uh, into account. Um, and, and uh, excuse me, no, they are naturalized. Forgive me. Uh, these are naturalized forecasts. So if there were no diversions, I'm, I'm sorry, I was thinking about our, uh, the, the way that we um, calculate the, the actual stream flow values. Forgive me. No, these are naturalized forecasts. Um, so we do not take into account management. I'm sorry. Forgive me for, I can't believe I even slipped up on that. <laughs> no, I think it makes sense what you, what you said though, Brian. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. And uh, thank you, Tracy. Let me know if there are any other uh, questions in the chat. I, I'm, uh, I think it's kind of easier to address them as we go yeah. through. Keep an eye on it. Thank you. Okay, uh, so here is the progression, uh, just a month-to-month -month progression of reservoir storage in each of the uh, basins. You can see statewide, we've, we've trended up a bit, which is great. It's, this is typically not the, the storage time of year um, so much, but, uh, but it is good to see that snowpack is coming up. So we'll have to see how things play out this, this uh, spring. All right, uh, this is the only one of these graphs that I have, I believe, um, just comparing statewide uh, reservoir storage to the historical, you know, trace as we see it. Um, really, I thought the state was, for the most part, with the exception of the South Platte, pretty consistent. So for the most part, I think this is uh, pretty indicative of much of the individual basins and, and the rest of the state, you know, uh, reservoir storage is below normal, but um, looks like there might be a chance of, of improving things a bit. So one of the bigger factors to me that has played into streamflow forecast over the last two years uh, is the low ana antecedent soil moisture and streamflow conditions that we've been seeing. Um, so what I wanted to do was, was point out where soil moisture is at this uh, at this point in the year. But first I wanted to start out by, by rolling back a little bit more than a year and, and seeing where things were because last year um, runoff was, was not, not great at all. Um, it, was, it was quite poor. And we were looking at, at some of the drier fall conditions, much the same as, as Peter has pointed out, uh, this is definitely becoming a trend. Um, and and it's, it's not a very good trend to start a year with uh, low soil moisture and, and, and uh, base stream flows. So uh, this is looking at October 5th of 2020. Um, things were, were pretty dry uh, that summer, the, the, the summer prior. And then uh, things got even drier, you know, all the way up to, the, to January 18th of 2021. Uh, and, and that really um, undercut that, even the low snowpack that we saw when, as it translated to actual streamflow runoff. And, and here this year, um, some of those streamflow forecasts that we saw a few slides ago um, are, are, are showing pretty good runoff 
Um, and, and it's based on the actual snowpack that we have in place. And it's also based on um, the slightly improved uh, soil moisture and moreover, the actual base stream flows that we're seeing. So here we're October 4th. I'm gonna kind of uh, roll back and forth like Peter did. You know, going to January 18th, things were pretty dry. Um, both west and east of the divide and in the mountains. That's kind of the concerning part. And then we roll forward again back to October 4th here, and you can see that things are a little bit improved in some locations, but really uh, soil moisture is pretty dry even still. Um, okay, and then uh, to the most recent uh, grace um, soil moisture conditions uh, here on January 10th, again, soil moisture is a bit better, but still quite dry. I mean, we're, we're not seeing these great improvements. So um, so this is one of those things that goes into what we're looking at for stream flow forecasts. Um, and then here, wanted to look at base flows. Again, I've rolled back to 2020 to see where those base flows were here uh, over the course of October. I would consider it the, the end of, or the beginning of November. Uh, so this is last year, things were, you know, pretty dry near about 50, 50% of normal statewide, um, you know, uh, lower in some locations and slightly better in others. Uh, and then fast forward to this year, we're seeing about a 20% improvement in those base flows. So here, this is this is um, uh, this is a a big input into the uh, potential forecasts for this year. So what I'm getting at is looking at those streamflow forecasts that we saw a few slides ago. They're they're on the higher side. Um, but I kind of think they might be a little bit too high based on the dry soil moisture that we're seeing and, and these base flows still being low. Now, um, I, I, I haven't, unfortunately, uh, I wasn't able to bring up, you know, the uh, December base flows, the December stream flows. Uh, we just had too many missing values uh, in, in our database at that point, at this point. Um, so I'm not exactly sure if things have drifted up a little bit more. I would think they haven't uh, because things have been relatively cold in the mountains and I wouldn't have expected very much runoff or, or, or soil moisture increase um, at this point. But uh, so what I'm, I'm doing is trying to just provide a little bit of caution at this point uh, on the streamflow forecast that we've, we have. Of course, we're so early in the year, uh, still a lot of winter yet to happen and there still is relatively dry um, base flows uh, and, and soil moisture, but it is improved over last year. So um, hoping things wind up looking better. All right, so before that kind of, yeah. I'm sorry, before you move on, yep. uh, you were getting at the question that I had and maybe others had um, about, you know, last year's snowpack was relatively close to average and stream flows on the west slope were so low. Um, and then the forecast that you showed, streamflow forecast that you showed just seemed really optimistic um, for this coming year. And so I guess the details that you just dove into for soil moisture and base flows show that both of those values as of the fall of 2021 are looking better than they were in the fall of 2020, which indicates, you know, moving in the positive direction. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it was so, sh the stream flows, I think were so shockingly low last year, even coming out of a pretty good snowpack that, um, you know, can I just ask you to expand a little bit more? I, I think you did say that maybe you thought those forecasts are a little bit optimistic, even though soil moisture and base flows are looking better this past fall. Maybe. Yeah, excuse me, one second. Keep getting a little tickle in my throat. Um, yeah, so number one, I am not a forecaster, um, but I, I've also heard that some of these really dry falls that we've had are, are pretty, are, are relatively atypical. Um, so, we're, we're kind of in an area that we're, we're not too experienced with. Um, it's a little bit new to have some of these drier conditions. Uh, and while things are a bit better, so I feel like the confidence and the skill and the forecast is, is a bit improved. Um, I, I still have, this is my two cents, I have a little bit of hesitancy um, to believe that the runoff could be quite that high. I mean, we're not talking about exceptionally high here. You know, Gunnison 130% of normal. Um, 
the uh, Yampa White and North Platte 120, or excuse me, the Yampa White uh, 126% of normal, North Platte 125. Um, some of this stuff up here, I, I, I'm a little bit more, uh, I think it could happen. The, the Gunnison, excuse me, I'm, I'm tending to want to pump the brakes a little bit. Uh, and, and here again, um, more than half of the, or excuse me, half of the winter remains, um, which could make big changes too. So, th so there's a lot of changes, but based on the information that we have right now, 130%, I, I would, you know, uh, think maybe a little bit lower than that. You know, sorry, I shouldn't hover over this number. I should be highlighting the individual, um, the individual locations here, the individual stream flow points. Um, yeah. Think, um, so, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. This is Peter. I just I just wanted to add in a, a quick comment on on the uh, translation of these snowpack numbers into runoff numbers, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, go for it, man. Uh, yeah. So I mean, um, one thing to keep in mind about last year, where we saw that huge disparity between April one snowpack numbers and uh, runoff numbers, is that we had a record dry April um, west of the Continental Divide, and that doesn't show up in the April one SWE numbers. So if you look at the, if you look at the April one SWE numbers and the runoff numbers last year, you go, well, what the heck happened? But if you look at the peak snowpack numbers, which isn't necessarily April one, you start to get a clearer picture. And then if you if you look at the um, you know peak snowpack numbers plus April and May precipitation, be that rain or snow, uh, it, it, things start to really fall into place. And then when you uh, again add on the uh, dry fall it really falls into place. And so like we don't have as dry of, like Brian was showing, we don't have as dry of antecedent conditions this year. They're on the dry side, but you know, it, it, they're not as bad as, as last year leading into the season. And then the odds that even with a probabilistic tilt towards a drier than normal spring, the odds that we, you know, have as dry in April or one that one up that this year uh, are, are pretty low. So, you know, I mean, part of the reason these numbers here are high is, is because it was made on January 1st, kind of near the tail end of that wet period. But but also, also I don't think these numbers are, are totally out to lunch because, you know, we have good snowpack and it's unlikely that spring this year will be as bad as last year west of the Continental Divide. Okay. Yep, that's perfect, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Yep, thanks. Yeah, thank you both. I appreciate diving into this um, this aspect. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sometimes those those spring numbers, um, uh, or that's the spring numbers. Spring precipitation can can give me a, a little bit of a, a concern too. Um, we just don't know what's going to happen and sometimes it can be dry but exactly like peter said they're they're not uh too far off the chart and then a really good point that peter brought up is we were kind of uh near about the the peak of the the uh the the larger storms um and the accumulations there at the beginning of january and then you know as is typical it typically dries out for a little while i mean that that's completely normal um and um i'll i'll highlight it here in a little bit but it, it's normal for things to kind of go in a stair step progression uh, as we accumulate snow and, and precipitation. Um, and then we kind of, you know, uh, dry out a little bit and that would bring the forecast down a little bit if we were going to look at some of the daily um, stream flow forecast guidance, but I didn't put any of those in here. Um, so, um, sorry. Uh, all right, so uh, moving on into the state basins um, or the individual basins to take a, a bit of a deeper dive and, and see how things kind of vary across the state a little bit more than just the, the the map depictions that we have here. I don't have anything to add for the Yampa White. It, it's pretty uh, near normal and, and the statewide changes are pretty indicative of what we've seen in the Yampa White and North Platte. Um, moving down into the Colorado Basin, um, snowpack is 124% of median and the rank is about uh, or is 10th uh, in the 41 year period of record. Um, so from uh, the December 1st through January 6th, um, time frame, uh, we saw 180% of median increase in snowpack, uh, and that translated to 6.4 inches of water. Maybe I should turn that around. 6.4 inches of water increase during that time frame translates to 180% of median increase. Um, 
in the South Platte, uh, we did not get the the early December boost there that the south, uh, the southwest, and honestly the western portion of Colorado received. But uh, I would say we we really received it in strides here uh, at, at the at the end of uh, December and, and the beginning of January. Um, and so here's that stair step progression I was talking about. So if we're going to calculate forecast, you know, right in here when we're getting this big boost. Um, but then we, we kind of dry out. This would this would indicate things could be, uh, the, the stream flow forecast might be a little bit lower than what we saw on that January 1st because um, things are a little bit more uh, normalized for lack of a better term. But nonetheless, we still are uh, in the, the 30, or excuse me, the 70 to 90 percentile uh, for snowpack, uh, both uh, in the beginning of January, uh, or, or excuse me, from now through the beginning of January. So that's still pretty good. Um, in the South Platte, uh, snowpack is 121 percent of median. This is tenth in the 104 or tenth in the 42 year period of record, uh, and that was a 4.9 uh, inch increase in water, and that's 184 percent of median. Um, and I also wanted to point out that from 12.23 to 1.6, the South Platte, uh, this is the largest increase that we've seen uh, in the 42 year period of record, um, and that is actually also indicative of, uh, of the, the statewide value. It was the largest increase that we'd seen. Okay, uh, the Gunnison is definitely uh, a basin to highlight here. Uh, it saw the, the best improvement um, from the December and early January storms. Uh, as of uh, yesterday morning, it was a, snowpack is 136% of median, and that ranked only 10th uh, in the 42 year period of record. Um, but it did wind up being almost nine inches of water increase, which is excellent for the Gunnison. It's been one of the basins that's struggling the most over the last few years, and that was 127% of median increase. Uh, wanted to jump into reservoirs here uh, real briefly, um, just because the, the Gunnison was uh, or is one of the, the lower uh, reservoirs, uh, basin-wide reservoir storage in the state. Uh, you could see where each of the reservoirs sit uh, here in this graphic, uh, and, and it shows that most of the reservoirs are below normal uh, at this point or at the, the end of December. So hopefully things will improve there. Moving into the southwest corner of the state, uh, spectacular gains here. We went uh, from pretty much the, the 10th percentile uh, to the 90th percentile uh, with these storms uh, through uh, December and, and not much gains here in, in January uh, in, in uh, the combined San Miguel de Lourdes, San Juan Basin, but still snowpack is 125% of median, excuse me, uh, and 15th in the 36 year period of record. You can see that we've dried out uh, and haven't received much uh, accumulation since uh, the end of December. Uh, that was a 10 inches of water increase. This is uh, basin wide. Uh, this was the, or excuse me, statewide. This is the uh, most water that we saw uh, in an entire basin. Uh, but to be honest with you, that's uh, relatively normal. The San Juans uh, are often uh, some of the, the highest water receiving area in the state. And that translates to 216% of median increase for that January, or excuse me, December 1st through January 6th timeframe. Moving on into the Rio Grande where uh, improvements were not so great um, as compared to some of the other areas in the state, but still pretty good uh, for the basin itself. Uh, currently snowpack is at 90% of median. Um, and then uh, this ranks 16th in the 36 period year. 36 year period of record. Uh, and uh, for the time frame here, this is 199% of normal median, or 199% of median increase. I uh, wanted to highlight some of the reservoirs here as well, uh, seeing as they're, they're some of the lower in the state, uh, but we do see that there are a number of reservoirs that are above normal. And with um, what we would consider near normal snowpack, hopefully that will improve. Last year we had um, near normal snowpack, actually I think it was slightly better than normal snowpack uh, in the Rio Grande, uh, but runoff was not quite so efficient. All right, and then finally in the Arkansas where uh, Snowpack saw the least improvement, um, and snowpack is, is still below normal at 85% uh, of median. This ranks 27th in the 42-year period of record. We only saw, um, out of those storms, 127% uh, of median increase. So still uh, much better than normal, um, but, uh, but not as great as the rest of the state. Okay, uh, so... Um, 
the Schofield Pass, as um, Peter pointed out earlier, uh, I, I decided to add a few traces in here, uh, a few of the bigger ones with the exception of uh, 2021. I just wanted to put that in there for perspective from, uh, from last year. Uh, here's the trace for this year. And then I, I threw in a few other bigger uh, years. You know, I, I found 2005 to be um, pretty interesting. It was a relatively similar increase uh, from about the, the beginning of December through about now. Um, 2017 was was an, a, just a huge year, um, and and it was it made uh, considerable improvements from here. And I've just picked random years that I don't remember what uh, La Nina or El Nino, uh, El Nino uh, these years were, but I just thought I'd throw them in there. Nonetheless, uh, Schofield Pass uh, saw uh, some really big improvements, uh, and here it's reflected. Um, in a different way, this is actual snow depth uh, increase. And uh, if you all aren't familiar, uh, snow depth as a compared to SWE, snow depth will increase and then it will decrease <clears throat> as the snow, excuse me again. Uh, snow depth will increase and then it will decrease as the snowpack settles. So here again, you know, we see this the bigger increase here from the, the end of December, beginning of January, and then we see these decreases as, as you know, high pressure kind of settles in completely normal. Um, that's just the way uh, snowpack works, whereas SWE usually doesn't decrease. Um, so I'll roll back uh, for the most part, or yeah, you can see here, SWE doesn't decrease unless you actually have melting, but uh, this is not melting occurring here in snow depth. This is just a compaction of the snowpack. Um, Snowpack is actually one of the more dynamic mediums uh, that we experience here. Um, so that's why, why it goes down. And that's just snow depth, let alone uh, facets and crystal changes in snowpack. Uh, okay, so uh, kind of breaking down uh, the, the two accumulations, uh, or the two bigger storms here uh, from 12A to 1211, um, we saw about three feet of snow increase, and that translated to about uh, 30 or 3.7 inches of uh, snow water equivalent gain. Uh, and then here, looking uh, from December 23rd through um, January 2nd uh, at Schofield Pass, uh, we saw about um, what we would call about 144 inches of, of ski resort um, snow increase. I mean, really, you can you can do the math there. Um, you know, 71 increase, 71 inches in actual snow depth. But then when you talk about that compaction um, and the snowpack settling, uh, it, it doesn't look as great as as what those ski resort inches uh, would show. But that was that's a 14.4 inches of snow water equivalent gain. That's that's a lot. That's that's great to see. So um, almost almost 12 feet of snow by ski resort standards improvement there at uh, at Schofield Pass. Um, and, and many of the other sites saw uh, improvements that were not quite as great as that, but still great for, for um, the individual sites. Uh, I didn't show any of the records. Uh, I, I could have done that, but unfortunately, uh, I had a number of other things to talk about. So uh, if you need me to, I can bring that up and we can see uh, what, what some of those gains were at the, the individual sites and how they compared to the period of record. But anyway, uh, summing up, um, we had a great snowpack improvement uh, over December and then that very beginning portion of January, things uh, we really, really needed that. Uh, statewide reservoirs are at 78% of normal. Uh, still trying to keep an eye on the soil moisture conditions and those those um, antecedent stream flows, those base flows, um, still below normal, uh, but better than we saw last year. So that that translates to some some much improved stream flow forecast uh, across the entire state. We're looking near normal to slightly above normal uh, the further west you go. Um, so I feel like I've got some great news or I had some great news to provide here today. It was much easier to give than it has been in, in the previous years and months. But uh, hopefully the snowpack holds on and we continue to get uh, good precip and, and snow accumulation for the rest of the winter. That's all I got. Any more questions? Questions for Brian? Not hearing anything. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Uh, really appreciate the good news. Uh, really nice for a change to hear about that. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, folks. Um, 
If you guys would permit me, I thought maybe we'd go slightly out of order for the next couple of agenda items. I thought I could just give the drought plan activation update um, for what I know of it at least, and that is that the drought plan is still activated. And um, we have, with that, we have both the Municipal Impact Task Force and the Agricultural Impact Task Force are both activated. I believe that both of those task forces have basically just been on hiatus, um, anticipating and watching the snow accumulation season. And so I, I don't think there's any updates from those groups. Um, I would like to just give anyone from those task forces an opportunity to speak up, but um, I don't think there's been much going on in the last month as everybody just watches and waits for Snowfall. Um, I believe that the the cabinet level members of the drought task force um, they're planning to meet later in January, but I don't think a meeting has been scheduled as of yet. And um, Desi from Dola was letting me know that um, the municipal task force is planning to meet again in early March. And I'm not sure if there are any plans for the Agricultural Impact Task Force to start meeting again. So just want to um, see if anyone from any of those task forces wants to speak up with any particular updates from them. Tracy, this is Kat, and I, I believe the Ag Impact Task Force will be meeting on Thursday, actually, of this week uh, for its first meeting of the year. Okay, that's great. Thank you. All right, well, with that, we'll circle back to um, the water provider discussion um, and the other impact task forces, which is really when we might also hear just from members of our agricultural community or um, the wildlife community about any kind of water supply related impacts going on in those sectors. Um, I'll let you all know that I, I um, Reached out to Rob Harris from CBW. There's no real update from CBW in terms of wildfire, excuse me, not, not wildfire, wildlife impacts. Um, and if I could, I think I'd like to start um, just make an ask out to the, to the agricultural community, see if there's anything that anybody wants to mention in terms of um, water supply status for the agricultural community. I'm guessing for most of us here on this call who are involved in either municipal sector or other sectors, we're all just kind of in a wait and see mode at this time of year, but anyone from the ag community want to give an update? Hearing nothing. Um, with that, let's switch over to our water providers. I see that um, John Orr from Thornton, who's Coyote Gulch here on, on our call, just put into the chat, um, Thornton production is about 3% above average, storage is about 73% of average. Um, I wanna ask, um, Throughout the summer, there was a group of municipal water providers who were meeting uh, largely to talk about messaging in terms of the drought. I see um, Jason from Denver Water is on. I wonder if there's any update from the group of water providers. Jason, I see you there. Yeah, hey, Tracy. Um, so we are actually meeting uh, this afternoon again. We had a uh, several month uh, pause in meetings just because of conditions getting better. And of course it's the winter. So no updates from us right now. It's just the kind of preparedness, sharing uh, different lessons learned um, and improving our uh, plans and, and uh, uh, kind of communications um, so we can be ready for the future. That sounds great. Um, I, Maybe rather than going individually through the water providers, which um, you know, if folks want to give an update, definitely happy to hear it. But 
again, I guess like I've already said, I think folks are probably mostly at this time of year in wait and see mode, but can I just open up the mic, I guess, in case any other water providers want to give an update, mention any concerns or issues that you're facing related to water supply at this time. Everybody's quiet. Yeah. I, hey, Tracy. I think, oh yeah. Thanks. Sorry, Jason, Jason Feinhout, Denver Water again. I just wanted to say, and this might be the case for um, a lot of the providers who get a significant amount of their water from uh, South Platte or Colorado River basins, we have seen a great jump in our snowpack. Right now our uh, snowpack for on the South Platte uh, collection system and Colorado collection system are both above 100%. We're at 106% of snowpack at uh, South Platte and 102% at Colorado River. And then our reservoirs are actually at 83% full uh, normal this time of year is 82%. So everything has really trended much better uh, since the start of the calendar year and uh, pretty excited to see it. Yeah, it's nice to have a meeting where we can be optimistic. So thank you for the nice report. Who else would just like to add about what they're seeing for their system, what they're thinking about as a water provider? All right, well, not hearing anything and, and it, maybe we can say today, at least for once, no news is good news. Um, do want to point you all to our agenda where we have a listing of our February, March, April, and May dates for the WATF and hope you all can tune in then. Any last um, announcements before we convene our call? Announcements, questions, comments? Hey, Tracy, I just have one more shameless uh, self-promoting plug, but I don't know if anybody saw it in the chat, but um, yeah, we'll have that. Um, Peter mentioned it, but we'll have that uh, podcast with Russ uh, as of 1130 today. So if, uh, hopefully people enjoy it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Tracy.